So I'm Courtney Thorpe, and this presentation would be something I would want to give to a new hire at my nursing facility. Because coming straight out of CNA schooling doesn't give you all the tools in real life situations. So in order to make you know patients happy, I formulated this plan. So have you ever wondered how to give someone the best care that is in your power. Caring for a person properly will not only save you time and energy, but it will help that person recover much sooner. So I'm going to be talking about answering call lights and helping the patient, also offering to take them to the bathroom and then positioning them in a comfortable position, and also offering pain medications and other assistive devices. When a patient calls for assistance, the best thing that you can do is to get their call as soon as possible. Answer your patient's call at. First, you're going to knock on the door. And it is important to upkeep your patient's privacy. It's one of the biggest things that you can do. According to nursetogether.com, it's a, it's a website that most people go to in the health profession that helps them with tips and tricks and also policy updates. So another important thing to knock on the door for is so you don't startle your patient. Make sure that they know you're there in case they're not fully dressed. And then you're going to enter the room. You're going to announce who you are and what your title is. Say if I have a patient named Mrs. Johnson, I would say, hello Mrs. Johnson, I'm your CNA Courtney, what can I help you with? You're going to turn off the call light and then, of course, ask the patient why they're calling. Then you're going to help your patient. You're going to provide the assistance that they need and then supervise or transfer the patient, depending on what their needs are. Now that I have told you how to answer a patient's call light, I will now explain the next step in caring for a patient. <coughs> You're going to offer to toilet them and comfortably position the patient. You're going to ask the patient, one, if they need to go to the bathroom. And then if they do, you're going to explain the transfer process. Say if they are wheelchair ridden, you're going to help them by explaining to them, the wheelchair is on your right side because your left side is affected. And I'm going to pick you up and we're going to pivot you into the wheelchair and then get you into the bathroom. After you toilet them and transfer the patient back to bed, you're going to help position the patient. According to paramedicine.com, a site for healthcare workers and tips and tricks on positioning and why it's important, you're going to ask the patient about what position is most comfortable for them. And then if they say a certain position and you say it may not be right for them, say if they're a knee patient, you're never going to want to put a pillow underneath the affected knee. You want it to heal straight, not bent. So you're going to offer all the positions you think are right for the patient. You're going to pick one. You're going to offer pillows, either on one side, the other side, or underneath their calves. And then after you position them the right way, you're going to position the call light and offer them blankets. And also make things within reach, like their water, you're going to position their TV remote and also their tissue so they don't have another need to call you for something silly. Finally, you must assess your patient. You're going to offer pain medications and assistive devices. According to the National Center for Biotechnology Information, they did a study on the importance of pain management. Pain management helps your patient heal and also makes them able to do therapy a lot easier. So you're gonna offer pain medicine and assessive devices. You're gonna ask your patient their pain level, like this, we use this Lego pain scale because not everybody's gonna know what their pain is on what level. So zero is no pain, happy, die, and 10 is the worst pain you could ever feel. And if they're about a four or five or above, you're gonna ask your patient if they would like pain pills. 
And then after you ask for, about pain pills, you're going to offer assistive devices, including a polarized machine, usually used for knees. It's a dry application of cold. That way it doesn't, it doesn't make your patient wet, even though it does produce a lot of cold. Um, ice packs are always good for like hips, and then a CPM, which is called a continuous passive, passive motion machine, meaning it's for a knee. It slowly bends and straightens the knee. And then you're going to strap the patient in or apply the ice pack and then set up your CPM. In closing, if you ever care for someone, I hope you follow these steps. Because if you do, you will be saving yourself some tiring work and you'll be amazed when you see improvements in your patient. Any questions? Here's one of the questions that I would think of if I was watching this presentation is, why would the general public need to know how to care for a person? Well, honestly, you never know if a family member, a friend, becomes ill one day, and they don't want a stranger to care for them. It's kind of weird for people, even though we have the expertise and the training, it's not always on a personal level. So. It's good for you guys to know this so that the person you're caring for gets the best care possible without having to go into a facility, say, especially if they're on hospice care. I mean, not everybody wants to die in a facility. Some people would like to die at home, so it makes them more comfortable. Um, and why is positioning so important when it comes to caring for a patient? Well. Sleeping is the number one thing, other than nutrition, that helps your body heal. In order for your body to heal after a surgery, after being ill, is to basically get a lot of rest, get a lot of nutrition. But in order to be comfortable enough to sleep, you have to be in a comfortable position. And not everybody can get themselves in a comfortable position. You know, we have some people that are new paraplegics that can't move the lower half of their body, and you're going to have to help them make sure that they're comfortable so they can be strong for the next day if they're doing therapy or if they have a special activity that they like to do. That way they can get out of the hospital sooner. Yes? Um, how come more hospitals don't use the Lego Haley scale? Because I had to go to the hospital like a couple months ago, uh -huh. And it's like hard for me to say, oh, right. I'm thing with five, I, I don't know. But like with the Lego scale, I recognized exactly right. where I was. So I'm just wondering why we don't well, use that more. Believe it or not, it's a pediatric pain scale. No. <laughs> uh, my facility realized that it's not easy for the patients to tell us what type of pain they're in, depending on the scale. So they enacted and found this Lego pain scale so they can be like, that's my face, that's what I'm feeling, yeah. this is the number. Most of the hospitals don't view that as very professional since we're dealing with older patients and they feel as if it might undermine the patients. So, I mean, always ask your healthcare provider. I don't understand the zero to 10 scale. Can you explain to me? Can you show me the faces? <laughs> yeah, can you show me the patients? <laughs> Do you have a pediatric scale? Because <laughs> that's basically what it is. So. Okay, cool. <laughs> All right, any more questions? Everybody good? Okay. Um, so, out of all of the things that you encountered while you were in what would you say is the, like, the, one of the most like heartbreaking scenarios that you've seen someone like suffer through? Um, when they're fine, because I work in a rehab facility, when they come in with like a knee or a hip, you know, they're a little confused, so they try to get out of bed by themselves, and they end up falling so hard that they break their pelvis or another hip, and then they just decline and go on hospice and die in our facility. That's probably the most heartbreaking thing I've seen. Or the hospital will send us someone who isn't on hospice yet, but is hospice worthy, and they die two hours after they're admitted. That's really hard. Or, you know, just receiving someone. 
or you go in to check on your patient who isn't going well because they have like a low grade fever and you end up finding them unconscious with no pulse. That hasn't happened to me before. So, so how do you separate your emotions from your workplace? It's always been a huge challenge for me thinking of anyone doing this. Too. I, I view it as the, as professional and as put together as possible when you're in the room doing your job and after everything's all, all over or somebody takes over, you are allowed to cry. You are allowed to feel emotions. You just saw someone die. You just saw someone leave this earth. It's okay, but try to keep yourself together in the room, especially if families around. So they encourage, like, if, as a, it's okay to feel like they don't have, like, a, you are not supposed to feel, you No, know, you are allowed to cry. We're all humans. You know, most people in the medical profession have a very caring and giving personality, yeah. so they expect it. But they expect you to do your job and do your job well and put your emotions aside till the end. Yeah, because yeah, I worked at a, like, old home for like disturbed food and you could tell like kind of which ones weren't going to be around very much more right. like stop eating the main meal or want dessert you know and that was already hard enough for me like sitting in someone's table sitting and then coming out and everyone being like oh sweetie henry would have loved it just that way like he's not with us anymore and you're like ah go back to the kitchen no one told me like yeah it's always so hard so kudos good on anyone that can do anything it's not an easy home. job but it's definitely worth it when you do touch the heart of other people Thank you.